I'm Ravi Dar, Professor of Marketing at Yale, as well as the Director of the Yale Center for Customer Insights. I'm really pleased to have Bob McDonald here, CEO of Procter Gamble. He gave a wonderful talk on leadership this morning to the students, and now I'm going to ask him a few questions related to the business and marketing strategy. Bob, I want to start with the sort of general growth strategy. You mentioned that it is sort of, it can be nicely summed up in touching more consumers in more parts of the world more completely. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on that on the sort of the key pieces of those three components? Sure, sure. It all starts with our purpose, which is touching and improving lives. And then from that, we devolve to our strategy, as, as you said, Ravi. Uh, when you talk about uh, touching and improving more lives, more parts of the world, more completely, the more lives is about getting to as many consumers as we possibly can with as many products as we possibly can. Uh, right now, the average consumer in the world, the average man, woman, and child in the world, spends $12 a year on Procter & Gamble products. We'd like that to be $14 a year in five years. Talk about more parts of the world, that, the idea there is filling out our product portfolios around the world. We're in about 25 categories in the U.S. The average American spends $110 a year on Procter & Gamble products. In China, even though we're the leading consumer goods company, uh, the, and, and we do about uh, $4 billion a year in, in business, the average Chinese spends less than $3 a year on Procter & Gamble products, and we're only in about 14 categories. So we have to get all of our categories around the world in all geographies. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, taking the U.S. product or the European product and putting it in a developing market. We have to design for the consumers in those markets. And then the, the uh, more completely part is, is just about getting people to buy more Procter & Gamble products. And, and really that's about um, things like extending our distribution into rural areas. There are still many areas of the world where there aren't economies in villages. And we know that through our distributors, through our sub-distributors, we can get into those areas and create economies. So the way we're measuring this is we, in five years we want to go from 4 billion consumers touch to 5 billion and from $12 per capita per year to $14. And then, of course, the appropriate financial measures. You mentioned designing products for China and India a little bit differently, maybe the price points, maybe even the benefits. And Jeff Immelt at GE has talked about sort of innovation can be command and control and, you know, sitting in Fairfield and then spreads to sort of remove certain features in selling in China and India. And so one of the interesting thing as a scholar academic for me is that means you have to really innovate uh, both at the top end, if you like, sort of more uh, for the U.S. or developed markets, and at the bottom of the pyramid, if you count the markets in sort of developing countries. Yes. How, what, what kind of challenges does it face in the innovation, or do you think it's the same way you do it or slightly differently? Well, it's a huge challenge, because what, what we believe is you, we, our mantra is we want to delight, don't dilute. What many companies do is they take a, a top-tier product and they dilute it for the bottom of the economic pyramid. In our experience, that doesn't work. We have to innovate discreetly for every consumer, no matter where they are at the economic pyramid, based on their needs. Uh, being in the consumer goods business, it creates a great discipline, but a great opportunity because consumers are so different. I'll give you an example. Um, I led the hair care business for Procter & Gamble in Asia in the 1990s. And Asian hair is twice the diameter of a Caucasian hair. Well, you remember your geometry, that means there's six times the surface right. area. So the Pantene that a Japanese consumer would buy would have a lot more conditioning than the Pantene that an American or a Western European would buy. And if we got that mixed up, or if we tried to give them the same product, they both would be dissatisfied. So you can't you can't titrate toward the middle. Mm -hmm. You've got to allow those differences. Another example is in the Philippines. People do their laundry by hand. Water is very expensive. Uh, I lived there for four years. Water came by my house uh, only a half hour each day. I had a pump on the street. We would pump it into a tank in our property um, and then from that tank to the house. But it was very expensive because you only had it half hour a day at most. And um, Filipino consumers are very cleanliness conscious, so they really soap their clothes. They do their laundry by hand, they really soap them, and they judge their solution, soap solution, based on the amount of suds. Well, the problem is, because they create so many suds to get their clothes clean, it takes them five rinses 
to rinse their clothes from the suds. We developed a product called Downy. You're familiar with it here in the United States, but it's a very different product where um, it provides a little bit of freshness, a little bit of uh, a softness, but importantly it has cations that sequester those anions of the soap and allow um, one rinse. So it's called Downy Single Rinse, saves money because you eliminate the four other rinses, so the product virtually pays for itself because you save money in water. Those products are discreetly designed for those consumers. And um, frankly, I think that's the future of the world. If you think about marketing, your, your discipline, um, the ultimate is a one-on-one -on -one relationship with every consumer in the world. That's going to be possible with digitalization. The first company who achieves that will win because the brands you know, the brands you love, are ones that you're extremely loyal about and you have a relationship with that brand. Now, it may not be possible today to create that one-on-one -on -one relationship, but we got to get as close as we can get with that. And eventually, we have to create that one-on-one -on -one relationship to create indispensable brands. It's interesting you mentioned about sort of the different countries and how they might be, whether it's how they wash or you know all the infrastructure on washing might impact what insights you can leverage to create better products. And of course, you have this challenge that Gillette, one of your acquisition, was often sort of a little bit more uh, command and control, mm -hmm. you know, based in Boston, and let's, uh, let's sort of generalize. So it seems to me it varies a lot by the type of product category where these things become a lot more important and costly to develop also. It does. Um, it varies by product category, and it varies by what I would call the maturation of that category. Um, when I started with Procter & Gamble, I was the Tide brand manager in 1984 in the United States. At that time, Tide had about a 20% market share. The number two laundry detergent was Whisk, run by Unilever at the time, had a 12% market share. And Tide only came in one form, which was powder Tide, regular scent. Uh, today, Tide has doubled that share, over 40%. But Tide comes in many forms. You can get liquid Tide, you can get Tide with bleach, you can get Tide with Febreze. We just launched a, a Tide for fitness clothes. Um, and what you find is if you're the one who has the consumer insight, you can segment the category. And if you segment the category, you're going to create better loyalty, more indispensability. And as a result of that, you'll have a higher market share. So um, it always behooves the marketer to get close to the consumer and get that insight that creates the segmentation. And we're doing that on Gillette products now. So I heard uh, you mentioned earlier about the purpose. I like this, uh, you know, my, I, and I might have it drawn, but I heard that it used to be for a long time improves the lives of world's consumers. And when you came along, you added now and for a generation to come. And I find that interesting because there's obviously a lot of, uh, if, uh, emphasis on both sustainability but environment as part of a business strategy as well, whether it's eco-imagination or GE. And the question I have for you a little bit, one of it is how do you, uh, how do you manage the tension? So on one hand, now for generations to come seems like there's no tension here, but it's a little bit like in the leadership thing you meant, uh, you talked earlier about if it's easy versus it's difficult, and so oftentimes there is a tension between what's good now and what's good for the generations to come. Yes. So I was wondering if we can, uh, how do you sort of, given that this is a challenge managers face all the time, what is some ways you guide your teams to think about these trade-offs or if you don't see them as trade-offs? And secondly, could you give an example in any of the business lines that how this tension was handled between what's good now for generations to come kind of mm -hmm. an idea. Well, we, we added um, that collection of words now and for generations to come a couple of years ago. And we, we did that to recognize the fact that if we're going to succeed as a company in the next 172 years, we've been around 172 years now, we're going to have to take care of the environment in which we live and work. This has always been part of the company, but we thought calling it out in the purpose would even strengthen it. So we have a, um, a sustainability strategy where we want to introduce $50 billion of sales of products that are better for the environment. We want to reduce our carbon footprint, and we want our employees involved in service activities, philanthropic activities uh, externally. Um, 
we think that it's not good enough for companies just to do well financially, they also have to do good. Consumers now are concerned about the products they're buying and the companies they're buying into, so we're trying to do a better job. Um, in terms of trade-offs, we talk a lot about having an and culture at Procter & Gamble. Um, many times, uh, leaders look at um, opposing points of view and think that there, it's not possible to do and. They think of it as an or. Short-term versus long-term. Productivity versus innovation. Um, you could go on and on. Uh, we don't believe that. We believe that you can find another way, an and way. And we actually teach our leaders how to deal with those dilemmas. Uh, we do it through our formal college training. P we call it P&G College. Uh, we also do it through our informal training. Um, in order to uh, get at the fact that you don't have to have those trade-offs, that you can oftentimes find uh, another way. Um, at times where we've done that, uh, well, there was, there was a time uh, not too long ago where uh, we had to uh, come to terms with the fact that we had been um, underperforming our competition in terms of top-line growth uh, since uh, December of 2006. Um, that was a painful, painful thing to, to realize. Um, and many people in the company were wondering, well, do I, do I put priority on profit or do I put priority on, on top-line growth? And uh, we, we, we developed a strategy that said, you know, we, we've got to prioritize top-line growth right now because we're not getting our profit in the right way. We're getting our profit through margin increase, and that margin increase uh, is not helping top-line growth. There was some paralysis in the organization. Um, but the beautiful thing about the culture of P&G is, is you identify an issue like that. We call it the moose. You identify the moose, you put the moose on the table, and then people solve it. And uh, as a result, we identified that. Uh, we promised we would get back to top line growth. We did it a quarter earlier. We did it July through September rather than October through, uh, I'm sorry, July through September rather than October through December. And October through December. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we're now earning the profit in the right way by, by, by delivering the top line growth. I think, I don't think it has to be an or. I, I totally agree with that. And it's sort of going to something personal. To, at our school, you saw our mission is leaders for business and society, but a lot of the outside world tells us, you know, there's an impression that if you all care about the society, you might be a touchy-feely place. You can't be good for business. So it's really something that resonates in the marketplace with us also, where people often feel, how can you do and? It's usually or. So I think that... It, I, don't, I think you're right, because I, I, I don't understand how a human being can have incongruence in their life. Uh, human beings aren't that way. And so how can, you know, we, we believe that if we're going to touch and improve lives, just like the statement of, of your school of management, if you're going to touch and improve lives, you have to have that pervasive in everything you do, in your brands, in your philanthropy, uh, in your free time. Uh, and I, I think that human beings are wired a certain way. I don't think it has to be. I don't know how you can compartmentalize it and say that you should touch and improve lives here but destroy lives here. I don't, human beings can't deal with that incongruence, I don't believe. Interesting. You mentioned also in your talk that P&G has around 20 brands with sort of a billion dollars or more of revenue and another 20 around half a billion dollars. Any examples which you think are more sort of purpose-driven uh, and purpose-inspired, benefit-driven kind of in your business portfolio yeah. or outside that you admire in terms of the broader brands and the well, marketplace? Well, you're, you're, you're asking me to tell you which of my children I love more, so that's <laughs> hard to do. But let me, let me give you an example. Um, an example I like to use is Pampers because Pampers is our largest brand. It's about $8 billion in global sales a year. Um, Pampers, for years, struggled in our company. And uh, frankly, it struggled because we were too internally focused. We were focused on the diaper, the tapes, the back sheet, um, all the all the all the uh, product technical features, yes, technical yeah. features technical features. Um, a few years ago, our leadership group on Pampers decided they would focus on a purpose, and the purpose would be uh, caring for babies' development. And that took the focus and put it where it belonged on the baby, 
on the, on, on the mother, on, on the development of the child, not on the diaper. As a result of that, we became much more innovative because that freed degrees of innovation. We also were able to um, discover insights that we wouldn't have discovered previously. When we were in India, for example, we couldn't get mothers to use the diaper. Uh, mothers, um, disposable diapers tend to get used for an occasional event before they get used every day. And the occasional event in many developing markets is when the baby sleeps because the mother wants to get a full night of sleep and the disposable diaper is better than no diaper at all, which is the way most children sleep around the world is no diaper at all. Um, and the baby wakes up. And Indian mothers told us, well, I'm not going to buy that diaper if it's about me, if it's about convenience for me, because I care about my baby. So what we did was we did some clinical studies and we discovered, not surprisingly, that the baby who sleeps through the night develops better than the baby who wakes up every four hours because they, they urinate. Um, we then talked to Indian mothers about that and they loved it. They loved the idea that they were caring for the development of their baby um, by giving them a diaper that allowed them to sleep all night. The other thing we did is we found partners to help us. Um, we have a partnership with UNICEF where for every pack of diapers bought, uh, we work with UNICEF to donate uh, a neonatal tetanus vaccine uh, for a mother. Uh, somewhere in Africa. That's where the disease kills mothers and kills babies. We now believe through the sale of Pampers around the world we're going to be able to eradicate neonatal tetanus from the face of the earth by 2012. If we hadn't had that original broadening of the purpose beyond just the technical features of the diaper, I don't think we would have had the innovation that resulted in, in, this, this, um, in the UNICEF relationship or in the insights that are driving the business around the world. No, I think it's a great example of what we call being too product focused. And then yes. you have, the, as you I think, put it very well, then the degrees of freedom are constrained to the meds and MIPS and other specifications on which the diapers or computers vary. But if you focus on the problem you're trying to solve, like better child sleep, better yes. brain development, and so right. on, suddenly it broadens the link between a product like diapers to like happy well-being of the child, and exactly. it certainly opens up a lot of different ways. So I think that's a really nice. Uh, We've example. done the same thing. Uh, do you want another example? Sure. We've done the same thing on uh, Always, which is our feminine hygiene napkin. Um, in many cultures around the world, when women menstruate, that's thought to be a bad thing. Uh, there are some religions where menstruating women cannot go into the temple during the time they're menstruating. There are many cultures in sub-Saharan Africa where, for example, schoolgirls can't go to school while they're menstruating. They're not allowed in the school. Well, you can imagine, Ravi, if, if you're a student and you don't go to school one week every month, you're going to quickly drop out of school and the girls don't get educated. So we go into those societies. We teach them about menstruation. We teach them it's a good thing. In fact, the, the selling line we use on Always is have a happy period. It's natural. It's a good thing. And we provide our products to take care of the, uh, the condition. So um, again, it's an example of defining, defining the purpose broadly and uh, in dealing with the societal challenges and, uh, and using our products to do that. It's a great example. Let me ask you a question I get often asked by some of the senior executives in the, in sort of the consumer good space, which is uh, the consolidation that's happening in retail, not just in the US, but certainly Europe and other countries. Mm -hmm. And so one issue is obviously your customer, they are your customers, you're competing at some level for profits with them. How do you think it's changed, is it becoming, how you operate your business, marketing, or sales, like you know, traditionally Procter and others have had sort of a separate sales team, separate marketing team, doing what they have to do. And some of the things I hear people say that this, is, this will have to change as more and more consolidation happens. What do you see as some of the challenges for the way the business is conducted? Is it obviously you have to innovate more to stay ahead? What are some of the important issues that you see as consolidation happens? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. We're, we're not seeing as much consolidation as you would think. Um, our largest customer globally is what we call high-frequency stores. These are stores in places like India, China, Indonesia, 
which literally are the windows in somebody's home and people selling the products uh, out of those windows. Uh, those kinds of stores represent uh, just less than 20% of our business and they're growing much faster than, uh, than the global customers that we deal with around the world. Um, our largest customer, as we've disclosed in our annual report, is Walmart at 16, 17% of our business. That's stayed a relatively constant. Um, in the last five years? In the so. last five years or so. Um, even, I mean, even though uh, Walmart is continuing to grow globally, um, the, the growth of these small stores is so great, particularly when there's macroeconomic growth in the world. And there's so many consumers who aren't being served today that I think that will continue to be the force to, uh, to reckon with. Um, in that case, we, we work through distributors in order to get to those consumers in those rural areas where there's virtually very little economy. And in the case of Walmart, we have a large team of people in Bentonville that calls on Walmart. Uh, Walmart is our partner. Uh, Mike Duke is a personal friend of mine. I admire him a lot. Uh, just like I do the other CEOs I deal with. And uh, we're working with them as partners to uh, enhance their business. At the same time, we're also cognizant that retailers have private label brands, which are our competition. And we believe there's no reason that consumers should have to buy any other brand than a P&G brand. So the challenge for us, as you framed it, is we it's an and again. We simultaneously have to deal with large global customers who are expanding throughout the world, and high frequency stores, which are very local and inherently by their nature. It's an and. We have to deal with partnering with retailers like Walmart and others. They rely on us for our consumer knowledge and insights to set their stores. But they also have a private label that's a competitor of ours. Again, it's an and. So I want to pick up on that private label aspect you mentioned because some uh, consumer packaged goods companies do make private labels uh, and if you are an economist, which I'm not as a market an economist would say, well, you already have the factory, you might have the excess capacity, the marginal cost is not there, you know how to make this, you know how to ship this. Uh, as a marketer, I feel like obviously I don't encourage a conflict between the idea of creating differentiation and then there's another manager sitting in Cincinnati whose job is to minimize that if they are doing private label. But what some other CPG companies do, I think, is they go in an adjacent category, which is sort of try to avoid the conflict, which is I make ketchup, I won't make private label in ketchup, but I make tomato juice, I, sure. can, I, I can make soup. What, so I, and I don't know what Procter makes any private labels at all or not. If it doesn't, um, I'm sure these questions must have come up over the years, and strategically and also as a business, like what is the sort of the thinking why we, this is, this doesn't make sense for us yeah. to do. Uh, we are involved in some private label manufacturer. It's in our Duracell business, and it's more a legacy of uh, the Gillette acquisition. The Le Gillette acquisition. Uh, we do not want to make private label. Uh, one of our five strengths as a company is consumer knowledge. Uh, and a second one of those five strengths is innovation. Uh, we spend $2 billion a year on R&D. We've spent $3 billion since 2001 on consumer knowledge. Um, we're a company where innovation is our lifeblood. We simply have to innovate, and we have to bring new innovations to market to touch and improve lives. I would find it very difficult to create innovations and then hold them back from retailers. And I think retailers, if I had a private label, would find it part of their negotiation to ask me for the latest innovation, um, which really wouldn't make much sense for our, for our company. Um, so we, we, we won't be a private label producer. So it's almost like the ones who do it, you think of, you don't want to say those in so many words, but it's probably the ones who haven't been able to innovate, innovate in their yeah. categories. I think innovation is a differentiator. I want to ask you something, just a very general question on the how the marketing, you know, suppose you were giving advice to students going into marketing at this stage, what, what are some of the exciting aspects, areas uh, of you, how marketing has been changing, what skills are required to succeed in this compared to say, you know, 
10 years ago? Is it yeah. the same skills? Do you see any changes there? Yeah. No, I think, I think marketing is exciting today because it's so much broader than when I studied it in my MBA program. Uh, when you look at all the media that are available for marketers today, again, if you, if you go back to what I said earlier, if you, if you think of the ideal being that one-on-one -on -one relationship that creates an indispensable brand or an indispensable relationship, um, there's so many ways to accomplish that today. You know, social media like Facebook, uh, digital, uh, still in store. Uh, just like it used to be. Uh, these small uh, homes that, that uh, are, are stores in developing markets. Um, there's just a plethora of opportunity and being able to be selective and choose uh, how to do it and then have a rate of return that will help you differentiate or discriminate between the different methods. I think it's incredibly exciting today. In the end, it also comes back to, do you have the consumer insight? Um, you've got to have the insight. That's why when I travel, I go in homes, I watch people use our products, I go shopping with consumers, I look for tension in their lives, and if I can find the tension, then I can come up with an idea that might help make their lives better. And then I have to turn that into a new product or service or a new approach to, to marketing. I think it's very exciting to be in the marketing field today, and I think marketing is defined more broadly today, has more potential today than ever before. Great. I want to end by asking you, you spent almost half a day here giving your talk, having lunch with the students. Any impressions that you took away about this place, that, about the students or anything else yet? Well, I, 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 love, I love the School of Management at Yale because it's, it's not just about taking care of the business or making the business successful but it's about the individual contribution to society. And that is very consistent with the Procter & Gamble purpose of touching and improving lives. Not just, versus, not just VR brands, we have to do that, and we have to deliver profit, and we have to deliver shareholder return, um, but also about contributing back with our philanthropy or with our community service. And uh, I just think there's a great congruence there between what Yale's trying to achieve, when I'm, what we're trying to achieve at P&G, and I think that's the future. I think what you're going to find is um, it's no longer going to be acceptable. Consumers won't buy the brands of companies that don't, don't take care of the philanthropy, don't take care of the environment, and don't provide community service. Thank you so much for doing Thank this. Thank you, Ravi. It's great to be with you. Thank you.